Today we've got Stephen Barnes, uh, who's well known for all kinds of, of work in science fiction. And I can't wait to crawl inside his head and find out more about what he's doing and uh, who he is as a writer. Um, and Stephen, thank you very much for being with us. You're very welcome. Uh, let's start this over again. I'm gonna close my office door. Okay, sure thing. Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure we're We can edit it out. Okay, hold on, hold on. Going, but just going just take me a second. Hold on. Sure thing. No Okay, now I'm all yours. Thank okay. you, thank you. Well, let me start over again then. We've got Stephen Barnes here who is well, well known for a lot of work in science fiction, a lot of groundbreaking work, a lot of great work. And I am so honored to have you with us and thank you very much for being with us. And Stephen, let's start out with, um, I think a lot of people probably know your, your writing origin story, but for those who don't, how did you get started writing? Well, I got started writing because I got tired of being spanked for lying. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember uh, when I was in grade school, I used to tell kids that I was a vampire. You know, and, uh, my mother, my mother would come to uh, open house, and little girls would say, "You know, Mrs. Barnes is Stephen really a vampire?" And she'd say, "You know, no." And she'd look at me and say, "Steve, did you say that?" I said, "No, Mom. Vampires don't come out at, during the day. How can I fight? How can I be a vampire?" <laughs> So <laughs> I realized that if I wrote stories, I got, you know, congratulated for it. Whereas if I told lies, I got spanked. So that was sort of the beginning. I got reinforced in junior high school. Um, I got beat up a lot. Uh, and curiously enough, both writing and martial arts tie into that. Uh, because really? both were solutions to getting beat up. Absolutely. Um, the martial arts were uh, the direct approach, the yang, the yang approach. Uh, the yin approach was to build alliances. And I found, I developed what I called the Scheherazade technique, where I would <laughs> hang out with the uh, football players because they all hung out uh, on the bleachers during lunch. And I would tell them stories, but I'd only <laughs> tell them half the story. And I'd tell them the other yeah. half the story the next lunch day. So if I was walking home and the bullies would start bothering me, if there was a football player on, they'd say, leave the little brother alone. <laughs> because they wanted to hear the rest of the story and they didn't want me in the hospital. Uh, so um, those were, were powerful early lessons that, that taught me that there was an, I had a capacity to tell stories that people were interested in and that there would be pleasure associated with doing it and in a lot of ways the rest of it came out you know from there very very cool now you've written a lot of stories yeah. uh, and you've worked with a lot of other people what are some of the favorite stories that you've written stories that you look back on and go i'm really glad i wrote that well certainly uh, the very first thing i published with larry niven uh the locust mm -hmm. the first novel i published with him dream park uh my first solo novel Street Lethal, um, the first collaboration with Jerry Pornell, Legacy of Herit, uh, my first alternate history novel, uh, mm -hmm. Lion's Blood, which is probably the best thing I've ever written. Um, my first television episode, no, but my first episode of The Outer Limits, I'm really happy with, The Stitch in Time. I thought that was, that was a really good piece of work. Um, there have been other things over the years, but those really jump out at me. I mean, there's a lot of my work that is just trying to learn and trying to stay in the game, um, get trying to get just a little bit better every time, or sometimes just simply, you know, make enough money to 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 stay alive. You know, there right. is no there is no shame in just being a professional writer. Um, you know, and so. I think that that's, you know, you, I'm, I'm willing to answer any questions you have about any of this stuff, but I think that's an overview. Well, we're, we're going to get dived down a little bit. Like I said, this is the first interview because I'm actually going to reserve you some of these questions for the Galaxy's Edge interview. This okay. is going to be a little lighter interview. But what if you, what is it about those pieces, like the Stitch in Time and, and the other pieces, what is it about those pieces that really stand out for you? Well... <laughs> I think each of them represents either a first or a high mark. 
you know, where I looked at the way people reacted to them and thought to myself, oh, they, they got what I was trying to do, or I was better than usual at communicating something I was trying to do, some combination of those things. But even if it was just a matter of it being the first time I did something, I, I, always, mm -hmm. I always get a boost emotionally from, oh, this is the first time. So with any project, I'm gonna try to find some way to think, oh, this is the first time I've done that because I know that that will get my engine, my, my motor running. Um, if I feel to myself, oh, this is just like the other one then I'm likely to not care, not care as much. So that's just part of the trick is to not fall into the illusion that anything is ever the same as anything else. So that every repetition is the first time. That's, you know, uh, a little kind of zen. Well, that's very cool. Are there any any projects that you wish you had done that you haven't? Any well, that you like, I should have done that one. Well, you, that people offered to me. Yeah. I can't think of one. There are projects that I've, you know, I've wished I could do that I didn't have the chance to do because the finances weren't there. I didn't have an offer for it. I didn't think there was a market for it. I mean, see, there are two, imagine there are two, circle mm -hmm. this here is of the stuff you want to write this circle here is the stuff that you think people will buy what you right. do is write where those circles overlap it's a little venn diagram there yeah that's right venn diagram you know and there are many stories that i'll probably never write because um i don't think there's a market for it but then i've been surprised there have been stories that i've had in my brain for 20 years and then an opportunity arises oh finally here's an opportunity for me to write that and that's happened um, but I, the individual works aren't important. Mm -hmm. What's important is the integrity of the process. You know, any more than ever. Yeah. Huh? Talk about that a little bit. Oh, well. The, the integrity it, of the process. Look, I mean, if you were to probably, maybe the smartest piece of advice I've ever heard in my life was I heard, um, it was, I was on a panel at a convention. And um, there was a lady who was, I think, the artist guest of honor who was on the panel, a couple of seats down from me. And we were being asked questions. And one of the questions was, what's the best piece of advice you ever got? And she said that she'd gotten her kids off to school and she was really tired and a little discouraged because it had been a chaotic morning. And she lived in a duplex. And there was a lady on the other side of the duplex who'd been watching her, you know, in her efforts, who was a grandmother. And she looked at the woman and she said, you know, parenting is so hard. And the grandmother said, parenting isn't hard. It's just daily. And that perspective that when you have to do something and failure is not an option and quitting is not an option, your real choice is to make your peace with it. In that sense, you're simply going to be doing this every day. It's just, you know, as the Zen parable goes, chop wood, carry water. Um, the same thing is true of, of working out. You know, if every workout, every sparring match I had to win, I, I, I would have quit. You know, mm -hmm. if every story has to be successful, I never would have survived. But if I look at it as a, a constant process, I'm going to be doing this again tomorrow, the day after that, the week after that, the month after that, then my attention is not going to be on the quality of an individual workout or individual mm -hmm. day with my son or individual story, but rather what are the emotions, the behaviors, the habit patterns that lead to excellence? I have studied this. I studied the lives of people who are better than me at these things. And I'm doing what it is that they did. If I do that, then I trust that over time I will get better. So it's the integrity of the process. Did I wake up today and get myself in the right mood? Did I set myself up for excellence by doing these things? You know, I exercise, I meditate, I set my goals, I check in with my family, whatever. Did I sit down and do the work? I have an entire system of writing called Chop Wood, Carry Water, where the basic principle is, uh, there are six principles, and the first principle is, you know, write one sentence every day, you know? And that, that if I stay on the path, and I have defined the path accurately, then if you take at least one step along the path every day, you will reach the horizon. So you have to be sure that the path you're on will actually take you where you want to go. And you be certain of that by studying the lives of other people 
who have gone before you by studying people, other people who have achieved that goal. In other words, you taste their donuts. If you like their donuts, then you try their recipe. You know, it's very simple. If you can imitate their recipe, you get their donuts. It's not that complicated. To the degree that you can imitate their recipe, you make their donuts. So um, I try to be sure that I've got the right recipe. And then all my responsibility is, is every day I do the things I need to do to make that day successful. The, the result of that is the work, the books, the stories, the, the skills, um, the relationship. So if you can define what do you need to do today to make your relationship good or to keep your body strong or to learn this physical skill or to get better at being a writer. And if you do that every day, then you will produce work. Some of that work people will consider to be excellent. And if you're on the right path, a, a higher and higher percentage of that work will be good. You start earning your way into circles where you only fail so far. It doesn't, it never gets, you know, it never gets, but so bad anymore mm -hmm. once you get to that level. So that's, that's what you do. Is, is that, help? does that explain it? That's lovely. Actually, you mentioned that your chop, chop wood, carry water yeah. uh, system has six steps. Yes. What are the six steps? Okay. Right. A sh right. At least one sentence every day. Finish, write one to four short stories a month. Finish what you write and submit them. Once finished, don't rewrite except to editorial request. Read 10 times as much as you write and repeat this process 100 times. Brilliant. Sounds it's like a, it should work. <laughs> oh, it does work. It's never failed for anybody who's tried it. The, the, the record is, you know, the, the 100, repeat 100 times thing came from my own experience because I was writing, but I wasn't selling much. And so I was starting to wonder whether or not I should quit. And I took a look at my role model and the typical person said that they wrote about 40 stories, 30, 40 stories before they sold. So I said, let me give myself more failure room than that. I'm going to go to 100 stories before I even entertain the notion of whether or not I should continue. So uh, I made it to about story 23 before mm -hmm. I told and I've never looked back. Um, and none of my students, no one who's ever tried this process has made it further than 27, 28 stories. It, because if you're doing those steps, I could teach an entire class on each one of those steps and why it works and, 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 and the rationale behind it. And I'll answer any questions about it. But there is a huge amount of sophisticated simplicity encoded in those six steps. As you can tell, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very calculating human being in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm cal I, like to think, I like to think that I'm calculating, but not cold. <laughs> there you go. No, no, you're not cold. I know that. Uh, <laughs> you're one of the warmest people I know. Oh, thank um, you. And, and I don't mean that physically. <laughs> no, well, actually, I am an exotherm. It, 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 it is true. I, I radiate a lot of heat. You know, it is, it is, it is, it is true of me. Um, my, my thought is that I agree with the Dalai Lama that the meaning of life is to seek joy, is to be happy. Everything else is in alignment with how can I be happy long-term, which includes things like service to my community, you know, loving my family and you know, helping other people, uh, being as healthy and energetic as I can be and making the little kid inside me happy by lots of playtime and writing is one of my playtimes working with larry niven is a is playtime for me and i'm beyond needing him in terms of a career thing but i love working with him because i love him it's as simple as that and anytime we get to interact in that way is is me being happy it's also saying thank you to a man who changed my life for the better. And I have no other way to repay him other by being the best friend I can possibly be. Sounds like a good way to repay. It, Definitely. I'm hoping basically at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm working on having a good death. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for what, what do I want my life to have meant on my deathbed when it's over, when I have no more ego, no more striving, no more if any of that stuff. Who is it that I could have been during my life that would give me the greatest peace? Be that person. Be very cool. Very cool. Well, let me ask you, because you kind of talked around this. Mm. Um, 
there's a big discussion right now in science fiction circles about yeah. the old guys versus the new guys. Huh? Now, you're not really a really old guy because you're still with us for one thing. But I am and a new guy. Not a new guy. No, you're definitely no. not a new guy. You're much more experienced than that. What do you say to the people who are, so I had somebody say to me once, oh, well, if we, we honor the old people, the old writers, the grandmasters, then we're not paying attention to the young people, the young because writers. That's not any more true than it is in any other field. You know, you always have mm -hmm. the people who've been on the road a long time, and then you have the people who are just beginning. You can respect both of them. It's a false dichotomy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, absolutely. That you, you want to respect the elders of your village because they survived. Whatever they did, they survived. If they have children, then their children survived. They, that means that they were able to hunt and gather every day over a long life. When you're just starting out, there are a thousand ways to not get to Disneyland. There are only a couple ways to get there in general. So, you know, the young people have all sorts of theories about the ways things work, but have those theories proven out. So it's, you want to listen to the older people of the village, the elders of the village for their wisdom, and you want to support the younger people of the village for their enthusiasm and energy. And some of those young people will become those old people one day. Hopefully. Yeah. Well, no, I, I almost always, unless the village gets wiped out, somebody's going to survive. And the ones who survive, you know, it's like, you know, it, no matter what you want to accomplish, I'm a big believer in modeling the success of others. Anybody can talk a good game. But if you say, you know, well, this is what you should do in terms of writing, I'm going to ask, what have you published? If you say, this is what you should do in terms of relationships, I'm going to ask, how long have you been married? If you say, this is how you take care of your body, I'm going to ask, what kind of shape are you in? I mean, seriously, if you got the result, then I care about your theory. If I don't like your donuts, why should mm -hmm. I care about your recipe? <laughs> well put, well put, absolutely. Well, turning this around a little bit, because um, you do have a lot of work out there. How have you seen your work impact the world around you? Well, I mean, on an individual level, that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's easy. I mean, I, yeah. I, get, I get comments from people all the time telling me that my work meant something to them or, some, in some cases, people even saying they felt like I saved their lives. But as a cultural impact, I was one of the, for almost 20 years, I was the only black male science fiction writer in the world that I, I could see. I mean, there might have been some others, but I'll tell you, I never ran into one in a convention. I never saw one's name on a book, and I never heard about one. So, you know, they were, you know, I was at a loss, and I asked around. There were a couple of fantasists. But for a long time, it was just me and Octavia Butler. Chip Delaney mm -hmm. had left the field. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that I helped change that part of the world because I kept that space open. And right now, there are more than you can shake a stick at. Uh, it's a good and, thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. You know, there's still more, more female uh, science fiction writers than male. So there are still some barriers that uh, I still have to, you know, I still have to help keep that door open but it's still a lot better than it was. Well, who are some of the young writers that you're seeing, either black or white, doesn't matter. Who are you seeing that you're impressed with? Well, actually, I'm not reading a lot of, a lot of fiction right now. Um, I watch a ton of movies and I read a lot of nonfiction. So, you know, I don't really know. I couldn't really tell you. I, I you know, I, I look at the people who are winning awards and I, I listen to them talking and so forth when I'm at conventions and all, and they sound fine and they sound smart and I'm sure their stuff is really good. I just, I have, I have a different focus in my life right now. You know, been there, done that. You know, after I've read X millions of words of what's going on, I know that I can focus on fiction in general and science. Mm -hmm. And the two together overlap to create science fiction. I don't need to keep up with the field. I need to write what I write and the field will either like it or not. Well, you say you're reading more nonfiction now. Are you seeing that bleed into your, your fiction? Sure. I mean, the, the aspect of, of science that I liked the most, that was my special, I mean, some people specialize in, in biology, other people specialize in, in you know, physics or this or that. I specialize in human, mental, and physical development. What does it cool. take to excel? 
what does it take for people to achieve their goals? Which is really sneaky because it, it, it fits into my books all over the place, but it also helps me as an individual. So I, I cheated in that sense. So it, whatever I'm studying about human psychology, motivational psychology, success psychology, success dynamics, things of that nature, neuro-linguistic programming, contemporary shamanism, you know, any of the things that I've studied, Ericksonian hypnosis and stuff like that, all that stuff feeds into my work, but it's not, my, it's not primarily about supporting my work. It's about supporting me, myself, and the work is a part of who I am. So as I get better at knowing myself, supporting myself, being who it is that I am, the work should, according to the theory I'm operating, should naturally, continually get better. Well, as I understand it is, so it must be working. <laughs> um, I think it works. It can work better. Um, I can always improve. Um, you know, it's, you know, like Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. You know, it, I, try, <laughs> I try to get better at the things that I know about, but I'm very aware that there are things that I don't know about, that I don't even have names for. So my primary goals in life are no longer connected to the acquiring of specific skills because I'm at a point right now where, okay, I'm just going to have to say this. You can ask for explanations and definitions. Sure. When I was a kid, I wanted to master three arenas of my life. I wanted to mm -hmm. master writing, martial arts, and relationships. And I did mm -hmm. that. Okay. Um, you know, my definition of mastery might be a little different than most people's, but I, I accomplished those things. The problem is that my conscious mind doesn't have labels for what comes next. Um, so all I can do in terms of my goals, and I have very specific ways of setting goals, doing incantations mm -hmm. every day to, to, or to align my body, mind, and emotions. Um, the best thing I can do is say that I want to increase by 1% a day in amplitude and congruence of body, mind, and spirit. How exactly that will look, I don't know. I honestly don't. <laughs> I, I suspect that the answer to that question lies in the extinction of my ego. The ego does not survive the transition to the next level of, of your being. Right. And so it will try to stop you and slow you down with confusion and sloth and other things like that. And I think in this case, it does it by saying, you know, well, you got to know what comes next or don't take the next step. You know, you have to know what's eight steps out or you can't take the next two steps. That's just not true. You can right. just see what the next two steps are and take them and then you'll see what the next two steps are after that. If you let yourself get confused by the need to understand what your brain isn't made to understand, you'll freeze in place, which of course is what the ego is trying to do to keep you because the ego thinks it's you and your right. ego will, the ego will kill you to keep from dying alone. <laughs> so yes. Yes. You have to Absolutely. be cautious of this. No, you're, you make, you say some good words there. There's some, oh, there's some, uh, some, some intelligence there. Definitely. Well, um, I, I believe quite, it. You know, if, I, I, I'm glad if it's useful, I can tell all I can tell you, I can't tell you I'm right. I can tell you that I'm speaking the truth as much as I can. That's all I can do. It's all you can do. Yeah. Is there anything better? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, now going back a little bit, you said you, the three areas that you wanted to excel in. Yeah. Uh, writing, which you've obviously done, yes. um, relationships, and you've been married to the brilliant Tannery Du for how many years now? 22. And I've got a 34-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. So I Goodness. declare myself to have mastered relationships. I, I think we can say you get that badge. Okay, yeah. now martial arts. What, yeah. what martial arts are you, are you working in? I have three black belts. Uh, including one that has the ranking so high, I don't even talk about it publicly. It's a lot like being a bishop at a local church. You know, cool. it's, it's a really good church, but I don't want people to misunderstand. But I've been studying this stuff my whole life, you know, basically since I was 16. And so, um, you know, uh, I have black belt in judo. I have cool. black belt, two different styles of karate. Um, I teach Tai Chi. I studied Filipino and Indonesian martial arts for many years, you know, and it's just, it's just part of what I do. You know, it's nothing special in that sense. It's just, I just did it a little bit every day for a long time. And when that happens, you learn a lot of interesting stuff. How did, um, because the three badges there, you've got the writing, the relationships in martial arts. Yes. How did the martial arts, how does that bleed into your writing or how does that come Oh, well, they're all, 
expression to who I am. And in any art form, the question is the same as in philosophy. There are only two questions in philosophy. Who am I and what is true? Okay. And so each of those disciplines, you know, who am I with my family? What is true about what my family needs? Who am I as a writer? What is true about the profession? Who am I as a martial artist? What is true about what these disciplines are? Answering those questions in multiple disciplines allows you to address the hidden question, which can't quite be put into words. The two, the two questions, who am I and what is true, are both different versions of the same question that cannot quite be put into words. But if I explore that question, each of those three arenas, and I, I learned a lot of stuff, but also there is infinite road ahead of me in each of them. It's like, I know a lot and I know nothing, you know, and it's okay, either, you know, both ways. I know enough to teach and I see very clearly all the people who are better than me at this, infinitely better than me in each of the arenas that I care about. I know people who are so far ahead of me, I will never catch up no matter what I did, even if I put all my attention there. There's just no way to catch them. Um, and that's the good thing, because what I'm getting is there's this road. It's called being a human being, knowing your truth, knowing who you are, um, knowing, having a model of what the world is. Uh, to a certain degree, the path of being a human being is very simple. Uh, I, uh, I have a master hypnotist certificate from, uh, from Transformative Arts Institute uh, mm -hmm. on, in Ericksonian hypnosis. And Milton Erickson was the guy who brought hypnosis into the 20th century. Uh, an absolute friggin' genius. I mean, he had a degenerative nerve disorder and was confined to a wheelchair, could barely talk. But somebody would come to him. He wouldn't use the, you're getting very sleepy. That's very 1950s. He would mm -hmm. just talk to you. And let's say you went to him for chewing your fingernails. He would just talk to you for, you know, for an hour. And you'd go home, and after a couple of days, you noticed that you'd stop biting your fingernails. <laughs> but after a couple of weeks, you noticed that you'd also lost weight, and your sister was getting better grades, and your parents weren't fighting anymore. <laughs> you know. And so I asked my my teacher, I said, "How did he do that? What in the world made it possible for him to do that?" And uh, my teacher said something very interesting. He said that Milton Erickson had a theory that everybody wanted the same things in life. And that was basically to grow up, you know, survive, to master your physical body and to make them in, in your immediate environment, to be able to, uh, to have physical autonomy, to be able to address your sexual hungers with integrity, to be able to find love, to be able to exchange legal goods and services with your community so that you can support yourself and a family to raise your children according to your values, to develop a map of the world that makes sense to you, that you can exchange with other people to keep getting clarity, to be able to give back to the community they gave to you, to become a leader and elder in that community, to age with dignity and die at peace. That no matter what you came to him with, all he really ever did was put you on that train. Now, if you're familiar with that process that I just laid out, it's very similar to the, the tree of life in Kabbalah. It's similar to, um, uh, to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. It's, it, it's dead bang the same as the yogic chakras. So basically what you have is a transcultural, um, atemporal model of, of human life that you can look at. And, and even if you're dealing with, your, with someone and you can say, you know, I don't know what I want next, or the person says, I don't know what they want. You know what they want. They want to be on what I call the Kundalini Express. They want to mature in yeah. those ways, to have that autonomy, to have, you know, so forth and so on. So once you know that, it's enormously clarifying because it says to you, oh, this is what life is. And wherever I am in my life right now, all I have to do is look at this and I know what's next. And I know what's next for me is developing. I mean, I, I received uh, uh, an enormous martial arts promotion in the middle of last year, I guess it was. And I was in that room with legendary masters. I, you know, I know it, my pretender voices were out in force. You know, it was like, I don't belong here. 
I don't belong here. But the 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 certificate, oh, it's sitting right here on my desk. <laughs> it's for it's called Ancient hey. Alpha Warrior. It represents that I've spent over 40 years in the martial arts. And wow. I was asked by a couple of the masters I was sitting at the table with, well, what do you teach? And I realized I didn't have an easy answer to that. That the easy thing would be to say, I'm going to teach these physical movements, you know, stick fighting, knife fighting, empty hands and feet, you know, grappling, you know, whatever it is. But you know something, there are a lot of people who can do that and they can do it better than I can. But what I have that they don't have is what was my way through this? You know, art is self-expression. It's expression of, of what you are at the deepest level. And so it is that what they're really asking me is what are you going to give back? And I realized that because I had so many emotional problems, I mean, it took me 17 years to earn my first black belt because I was dealing with so much fear. I had to learn how to deal with the underlying fear before I could simply practice the physical skills. Um, that the gift I have to give to the world then will be to synthesize everything that I used to heal that damage and okay. put it into a simple form so that if I could talk to my own 16 year old self, I could say, do these simple things and it will cut years off your journey. And that's in many ways, that's all, that's the only reason the human race has progressed. As individuals, we're not much smarter than chimps. The only reason we progress is because we can pass our knowledge on to the next generation and we can share with each other. So what I'm looking at right now is, is deeper answers to that question, who am I? And I've run through all the answers that can be put into easy language that I'm what I'm working with now is I'm going through the floor. I'm, I'm, I'm digging into the stuff that is not effectively represented with language. And if I can go deep enough in that, I can then bring that back. And then with my writing, I can put it in the language. That's both fiction and nonfiction. And in my martial arts teaching, I, teaching, I can use direct experience. I can put hands on you. I can put you under stress and shift your breathing so that you breathe differently when stress mm -hmm. comes. If that happens, you stay calm even under stress. Give somebody that gift and fear then becomes a natural, normal, healthy thing in your life because it does the thing it was intended to do, which is get your attention and get you to prepare for change, okay? If you interpret the, the fear, which I did as you can't, you shouldn't, you mustn't, you're small and weak, you know, so forth and so on, you're allowing your ego to get in the game. Fear is just saying, get ready to fight a room. That's all it's saying. Yeah. And, you know, once you get that, then your fear makes you sharp. You want to be afraid. If it's a situation where there is risk, you know, for your family or, you know, at a job presentation or, you know, writing a book, you want to be afraid. If the fear is in its correct position, you want to be afraid. What If the fear stands between you and the thing you want, then it's time, you know, you, you need the therapy, you need the readjustment, you need the realignment. But each of the disciplines, being a father, a husband, being a writer and a teacher, being a martial artist and a yogi, each of those disciplines gives me perspective on the other two disciplines. So it's sort of, uh, Buckminster Fuller had this principle called tensegrity, mm -hmm. um, which where, every, you know, it's like a, a sailboat, the sail in a sailboat works because there is reciprocal tension between the lines and this and the mass and so forth and so on. Human beings are the same way. It's, it's what I might call psychotensegrity, that every aspect of what you are is dependent upon other aspects of what you are, which is one of the reasons why a lot of the, the disciplines that make it possible to break writer's block are not contained within writing. They're contained right. within other disciplines like yoga, and meditation, mm -hmm. and martial arts. So, but once you get the disciplines over here, you can bring them over there, you know, and, and, and master. So 
I guess that's a long way of saying that each of those disciplines gives me perspective on the other two, and each mm -hmm. of those disciplines is supported by the other two. Well, I think that's brilliant. Um, well, how has, because you've had a long path, uh, and a, a good path, but a long path, how has that path changed your writing? Other than made you really thirsty. <laughs> Oh, it's hot here. It's 100 oh. degrees outside, and my oh, air conditioner is not completely handling it, but it's fine. Um, I guess I've just become more mature. I uh, More of my skills as a writer are at unconscious competence, um, and that's where you have to get any skills to create art. You know, um, I don't know. Are you familiar with the four stages to unconscious competence? Are you familiar with that? I've heard it. Yeah, okay. I haven't studied so you, it. But... So you go, let's say it's riding a bicycle. First mm -hmm. level is unconscious incompetence. You don't even know that bicycles exist. So you don't know that there's such a thing as bicycle riding. The next level is conscious incompetence. You know that bicycles exist and you know that you don't know how to ride them. The next step is conscious competence. You can ride a bicycle as long as you put all your attention on riding that bicycle. And the next step is unconscious competence look ma no hands the basic skills have all been absorbed to the point where you can do it with you know without thinking about it. all art you have to get the component pieces of your art to unconscious competence before you can just relax it's like as long as you're looking at the at the at the uh, uh the, the book the joy of sex you can't make love as long mm -hmm. as you're thinking about your, your where your fingers are on the piano you can't play music it, the music happens right. as soon as you're not paying attention to that stuff anymore. Unconscious competence. So it's always, no matter what it is you're trying to do, and that's the, def, you know, the definition of mastery, which I got from speaking mm -hmm. to experts on mastery who are just further along the path than, than, than me. The, the definition that I use is when you have the basic components of your skill and unconscious competence, and you have committed to your path for a lifetime, you are on the path of mastery. Mastery in that sense is a verb, not a noun. It is a vector, not a position. And you are as much on the path of mastery as anyone else who has ever walked that path. Some will be further ahead than you. But one of the things I've noticed about masters is that when you meet them, they don't care what you've done. They care what you're doing. What are you mm -hmm. doing today? Where are you studying? Who are you teaching? What are you teaching? What is your being right now? They don't put the fact that they're miles, horizons ahead of you on the table. It's not a matter of that. It's just, isn't the path beautiful? Isn't the path wonderful? Because you are one of the few who is actually committed. They love you. I have found masters in any discipline to be hugely generous. If you humble yourself, you're not in competition with them. It's like... Mm -hmm. What is the journey like where you are? What is the territory like where, where you are? It's so wonderful to meet these men and women. You know, they are sui generis. They are, they are different. And I, different. even though I'm a tyro compared to them, I am so honored to have been able to walk that path with them as much as I have. You know, there's an infinity left to learn. I will never get it. But I look back and realize how far I've come. And it's, it makes me so happy that I failed at so many things in my life, but at the things that the little kid inside me cared about the most, I've never given up. I've never given up. And that's, Very cool. well, that's all what? I can do as a human being. Please go ahead. Sorry. No, I finished. It's okay. Oh, okay. Okay. As you, you notice, I'll, I'll talk outside. forever about anything. So you definitely <laughs> want to cut me off. <laughs> My kind of interviewee, let me tell you. I love it. I love it. Well, which, because you've worked with a lot of great writers, which writers, the ones you've worked with or the ones you haven't, who do you consider masters in the writing? Oh. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask about the, the martial arts because a lot of our uh, viewers yeah, won't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I will only speak of the ones that I had personal contact with. Okay. To to some real depth. I mean, Larry Niven had mastered writing. 
you know, so had Jerry Cornell, mm. uh, Harlan Ellison, um, just beyond excellent. Yeah. You know, just beyond excellent. Um, but th there are other people who contributed to my life, you know, in, in one way or the other, you know, the, the, the Gordy Dixons and, and so forth. Uh, Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. I had many, many opportunities to interact. I mean, she, we were friends. We lived walking distance from each other for years. Oh, wow. And so we would get together all the time. And Octavia was beyond any doubt whatsoever a master and a, a greater master of her, you know, of her craft than, than I. And it's only, it's only right because she invested more of herself there. You know, if I had invested as much of myself as she had, then maybe it would be appropriate for me to be jealous of of that you know or you know but i'm not at all it's like you know oh well you, you got what you put into it um mm -hmm. there are so many people out there i mean my, my the writer i tend to study most most frequently would be william shakespeare because he's really? on everybody's top three list in the english language and so therefore there is more agreement on shakespeare as being the best of the best of the best than there is on any other single writer so i say okay yeah there are flaws there but he also is playing so far ahead of ahead of, uh, above the level of the game that there is an infinite amount to learn by studying him. What one or two things have you learned the most from him from his writing? That's a really good question. Um, I try. <laughs> I would say, I would say that there is nothing wrong with writing for money because Shakespeare wrote for money. So the greatest writer, you know, the, the guy who is most consistently considered the greatest writer wrote for money. So it, there, is no, there is no automatic conflict between mm -hmm. commerce and art. Well, it's interesting because you, at least I often hear, especially younger writers talking about how they want to be true to their art. You do. But that's where the Venn diagram comes from. You know, yes. there, are, there are many stories. See, if you write just for yourself, then you should, be re you, should feel, you should feel grateful if you produce something that you like. And that should be the extent of what rewards you. But the instant you start saying you want money, that's about making other people happy. That's about communicating to other people. You can't. You do not have the right to say, "I'm going to write just for myself." Now, give me your money. No. <laughs> what you have the right to say is, if you read my story, you will be happy. If you read, no, uh, Robert Heinlein, I think it was, or or Jerry. I think Jerry got that from Robert Heinlein. Said that a book has to be at least as entertaining as a six pack of beer because they cost about the same. So, your your need to express yourself is valid but if you think you can't express yourself and also appeal to other people i think you're being dishonest because i think that you're committed to being clever rather than speaking your truth the truth of human existence as milton erickson said is everybody wants the same things so if you speak your journey honestly and intimately if you go deeply into the specific you emerge in the universal so these writers, these young writers, have simply not lived enough of life to realize that, yes, every snowflake is unique. And they're exactly the same as all of the snowflakes in their uniqueness. <laughs> so they, they're allowing their egos. Their egos are what got them this far. Their, their willingness, their ability to protect themselves from the fear that they can't make it by saying, you know, I'm the best or whatever it is. You know, it's, that, it's the... The negative side of that Buddha baby energy that says, earth below, heaven above, no one in the world like me. Well, there isn't anybody in the world like you. It's fine. You're right. You're wonderful. You're, you're beautiful. Now let us see your magnificence and say it in a way that we can, we can undergo emotional changes. Give us the truth of your life. That's all that you need. You don't need to be clever. You can run out of clever, but you'll never run out of the truth. So they're still dealing with with the, the model that they created of the world rather than their experience of testing that model against the world. If I do, you know, using a martial arts method, I can do kata and have a hallucination and I'm the baddest bear on the block, but you put an opponent in front of me, now we'll find out what's true. 
So people who don't want to find out what's true get caught in that. And it's there, you know, I have to be true to myself. So I'm not going to read other people's work. Well, you notice that the fifth step of my process is read 10 times as much as you write. Mm -hmm. um, so they're just allowing their, their fear to stop them from being as beautiful as they really are. You know, the truth is that they're, they're smarter than they, than, than they could ever believe. They have more wisdom, more strength than they could ever believe. All they have to do is give up their illusion. I believe, I think that, you know, there's so many talented young writers out there. Um, and I know that we'll never run out of their stories. Well, not, not ever, ever, ever. You know, just uh, the best, the best is yet to come. And that's that they're going to be standing on the shoulders of giants. We say that I'm reminded of some of our new writers at Ring of Fire who are absolutely excellent. And I'm right. always excited for people to read them. But I'll, also I'm reminded of Octavia Butler. Uh, mm. You said something that reminded me of her because her writing always struck me as so powerful. Uh, in fact, there were times I had to back away from it because it was too powerful um, because she could take your take you right into her world and rip your heart out and feed it to you on a platter I mean she was that kind of a writer yeah. uh, so I really envy you having her interacted with her I would have loved to have met her um, she she must have been a brilliant brilliant woman so she arguably was the purest artist I've ever known who was not insane that's a tough road to hoe. Yeah, she was sane, but yeah. she invested so much of herself that I'm not sure it was totally healthy for her. But that's what you that. do. That's what you do. Yeah. You put everything of you know, you put everything that you have on the table. You can't leave anything in the locker room. You know, you leave all the blood on the field in that sense. I remember. I can honestly say that I've seen movies and read books that changed my life. Mm -hmm. One of the movies that changed my life was the Bob Fosse directed movie, All That Jazz. Yeah. And it's about a guy named Joe Gideon, a, a, a barely, you know, it, it was definitely a Ramona Clef about, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, uh, Bob Fosse's life, a mm -hmm. man who was addicted to sex, drugs, and musical theater, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> who was turned inside out. His public life was his private life. His private life was his public life. In other words, he gave the kind of energy to his professional life that you're only supposed to give to your children and family because he mm -hmm. treated the people who hired him as if he could die and put his life in their hands. Whereas the truth is that he worked himself to death basically. And on his deathbed, they're already talking about hiring somebody else. His, yeah. his daughter and it, to his daughter and his, his ex-wife and his girlfriend, he was irreplaceable, but he did not see that. And the cause of this, as far as I could see, was a conundrum that I knew I faced, and which is, in order to excel, you have to become obsessive compulsive. But obsessive compulsive unbalances you, and that unbalance will destroy you. And if it destroys you, you don't get to stay on the path long enough to become excellent. What in the hell? I remember walking out of that theater thinking, what am I going to do? Because I could see myself. I had a compulsion to be excellent with a real belief that life was going to destroy me if I could not be excellent. Partially, I'm partially connected to racial mm -hmm. issues. Um, and so it's like, what do I do? To become excellent, I have to become single-minded. Being single-minded will destroy me. And being, if I'm destroyed, then I can't enjoy my excellence or even attain it. So I went around and around in a circle about that. And I finally came out the other side. I decided, you know what? There's nothing that is totally safe to be obsessive compulsive about. But the safest thing to become excessive uh, comp compulsive about is balance. I became obsessively balanced that I literally will not let a day go by without interacting with my family and the people I love, without working on my body, without doing my writing. Not a day. That, that is total obsession. It looks healthy from the outside, but that's where I hooked my insanity. That's why. Huh? That makes sense. 
Well, it, that's, it's honestly what I did. So what looks to other people like a healthy behavior is in essence an adaptation. It's, it's the healthiest adaptation I could come up with knowing that we are driven by our compulsions. We're driven by our habits, the things that we do spontaneously under pressure. So rather than fighting against my addiction, I became addicted to a healthy life. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'm going to switch because we've got a few more minutes. So I want to switch gears just a little bit here. Um, I believe that you and Ms. Du are working on a project together right now. Yeah, we've got about 12 projects. Tons of them. And can you talk about any of them? Well, I don't want I don't want to mess up any. Nice I know. Well, we just finished. We've, we've got a, a screenplay that's been optioned called The Keeper about a grandmother who makes a deal with a demon to take care of her granddaughter. Uh, we've got another uh, screenplay that we just finished um, that is out to the first round of readers, one of whom has loved it. The other one didn't like it at all. So, you know, OK, there we are. So uh, that's we'll, typical branding. Well, you know, it's, it's just what it is. You know, like I said, not everything works. Um, we've got a couple of couple of uh, other movie things and a couple of television things that I can't quite talk about uh, okay. b because of, you know, uh, that's just the way the industry is. And like I said, I don't want to mess up any of your non-disclosures and get you in trouble, I promise. Thank How about you. books? Any other books that you've got you're working that are coming out soon? Not really. I mean, I'm working on a book with Larry Niven, um, and it's a Gil the, Gil the Arms story. Uh, okay. And after many years, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm, I finally feel, you know, that I finally felt like I could ask him if I could play in that universe, and we'll see how that goes. Um, and I've got a couple of graphic novels. Uh, one of them made from uh, the script, The Keeper, and the other one called The Eightfold Path, which is um, eight EC Comics style short stories, you know, science fiction, horror, adventure, you know, suspense, um, that um, each of which forms a pattern that, that the subtext on the surface, they're all just kind of booga booga scary stuff. But underneath the surface, they're all they're dealing with serious issues. There are each steps on Buddhism's eightfold path to enlightenment: right speech, right action, right occupation, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I'm working on that with a Buddhist scholar and writer, cool. uh, American Book Award winner, winning writer, uh, National Book Award winning writer Charles Johnson, a MacArthur Genius Grant. He's my only friend with his own postage stamp. Um, <laughs> Absolutely brilliant guy. And I've been trying to get this book written for a decade. And so now it's it, it's in the final stages right now. And that's is there eight stories in that. So I'm juggling a ton of different things in my head all at the same time. Oh bless you. Well, it sounds wonderful though. Keeps you I'm keeps you moving. So. I this this is an important project. It means a lot to me. Uh, it uses what's uh, the principle called via negativa which mm -hmm. is to use negative examples to illuminate a, po a positive outcome or positive moral sense by showing, you know, it's like the old, uh, you know, lights out or, or, or you know, that, that kind of radio show mm -hmm. where every, you know, each episode had a moral. They showed human beings doing horrible things and the moral was don't do horrible things. You know, so it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of like that, you know, hopefully a little bit more sophisticated than that. But some of the stories are just plain evil. I mean, they're just, you know, there are some of them that are sophisticated philosophically, but others mm -hmm. are just, you know, we just got down and dirty and nasty and just like, just had fun. Are you going to let us know when that comes out? I absolutely will. Any idea how long it might be? Late, yeah, I would, I would suggest late next year. Okay, fantastic. Who's that coming out with? Oh Jesus! I I literally I forget the name of the of the publishing company. The the editor publisher's what? name is John Jennings, okay. uh, but I forget the name of the company that that he that he's rep, he uh, is is heading up. Well, we'll be looking for that for sure. Oh, Absolutely. Good. Now, beyond that, where do you see going? Remember I know we're I only said, talking two steps ahead, but yeah, uh, only two steps ahead is is helping my son graduate high school with honors. Um, I want to attend a world martial arts, a uh, world uh, uh, Filipino martial arts festival in Manila. I was supposed to go there this year in March, but COVID had other plans. 
Um, and so I want to uh, I want to do that with integrity and you know asking myself the question what do I need to be for my body to be able to handle that and so I'm asking that question and uh, and starting to gear up my program and I've got you know I'm more than a year out and in terms of my writing I've got a complete business of teaching personal development things and that's where I'm going to be teaching the uh, the martial arts stuff for instance. So I've got a bunch of movies and, and TV things that I want to do, but there's also, I want, I'm, I'm very close to being able to synthesize what I need to synthesize in order to teach the way I need to teach. Very cool. I just got passed a message. Somebody's asking um, about your alternate history series, since we're on an alternate history convention, I guess I should ask that. So tell us about your alternate history series. Well, Lion's Blood is a book it is, it's set in a world in which Africa colonized the Americas, bringing white slaves here, especially Irish slaves. Um, Key and, twist. <laughs> well, it, it basically, I had to rewrite like 2,700 years of history. And then it took me six years of research to, to do that, to write the book Lion's Blood and its sequel, Zulu Heart. Um, there mm -hmm. is a possibility that if the, if Eightfold Path goes well that I'll have an opening to write the third novel in a graphic form because I already know what wow. the novel is. Uh, the, the third novel would be a parallel to the Civil War that will deal with the slaves fighting for their freedom. Um, and um, it's called the, it would be called the Bronze Nile. And uh, I would love to have a chance to do that. Well, let me ask you, because you mentioned that we ha we don't really see much African history in alternate history. I mean, we do some in 1632, but very little. I mean, just because That's we're- because most of the movie. writers are white. Yeah. It's as simple as that. People- so how, do every, we, how do we change that? Oh, just diversity. You know, as more writers come in, you'll see more of it. It's really, it's really as simple as that. In order to have women represented with as three-dimensional beings you needed to have women writing and behind the camera you know, and, and editing you know in, in in order to have lgbtq representation you know that that reflects their lives and their inwardness you need to have them in there in order for african americans to to see images that reflect who they are they need to be represented there there's really i see no other solution how would that help um, because one of the big calls right now, at least in the U.S., and I think probably internationally, too, is to get more awareness yeah. of, of well, diversity if, issues. If, how, if, would, how would working in alternate history in that way help with that? Well, to write an alternate history, you have to understand history. In other words, in order for me to write an alternate history, I had to have a good set of definitions or a good theory about how I believe our current timeline worked. Why did it happen this way? Why did Europe conquer Africa as opposed to the other way around? Those kinds of questions. And so um, if you have, I dive, you know, if you had a woman writing convincingly about a world in which that was matriarchal rather than patriarchal, for instance, that she's got to do so much reconstruction. She has to under, she has to be able to make us believe that that could happen. By doing that, she has to understand, she has to have a, a theory, whether I agree with it or not, of why things happened the way they did in order to get, in order to create that alternate. By doing that, she is, I think, illuminating her view of what it is to be human. Remember that thing, you know, what, who am I and what is true? So if black people, for instance, write alternate histories, we're talking about the way we see things. Uh, any group of people is going to write their material in such a way that they are the center of the universe. That's just what human mm -hmm. beings do. So you need what you need to do is to is to be aware of that truth and have a lot of different centers of the universe. At which point we all get to laugh together at the joke. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, what? Got several different questions, and all of them would take much longer to ask than I possibly got time for now. Um, but if someone, and you just kind of hit on that, is that if you want to write alternate history, because like I said, we've got a lot of, probably a number of our viewers are readers of alternate history. Yeah. Uh, what 
what are the the cardinal sins of alternate history as you see it? Well, what do you not want to see, do? You understand there are things there are things about human beings that cannot be proven or disproven logically. You can't, you know, the, the experiments to prove whether it's nature or nurture would make Dr. Mingley gag. So you have to be honest about the fact I am going to proceed on faith, for instance, I personally, that human beings are basically just individuals. We're just, we're just people. We're all pretty much the same, that the differences are contextual and environmental. But there are plenty of people who disagree with that. And they are often not honest about the fact they disagree with it. There are plenty of people who feel no. There are some people, some groups of people who are superior to others. I think that whatever your theory is about what human beings are and how we became what we became, you need to think through it deeply enough that you're willing to actually represent it. You're actually to speak your truth. Uh, you need to study history and, and have history aligned with what you know of the universe, the phenomenological reality, such that you can create a thesis and defend it. It's, that's not a matter of truth. It's a matter of saying, this is what I honestly believe. I can't say that I know the truth. I can say that I have very clear opinions and I'm willing to defend them at any length, at any time, to anybody. Okay. Um, and that is the truth. Um, and it, it is only by speaking your truth that you then become part of the human conversation, which I think is a useful thing for all of us. And if someone wanted to reach out to you to, to get more information on any of the things you've talked about, how would you recommend that, either to you or to someone else? Well, uh, you could uh, go to my website, stephenbarneslife.com. Liferight.com gets to me. I'm on Facebook. I'm all over the place. I, mean, I, ain't, I, ain't hard. <laughs> I don't think anybody has that much trouble finding me if they really want to. Probably not. And are there any questions I should have asked you? Anything you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask about? Not really. You were fine, huh? Okay. Well, I just like to make sure, you know, because sometimes somebody have this, somebody has this idea sitting in the back of their head, going, "Gosh, why didn't she ask me that?" I, so I want to make sure that we got it all. You know, I, I am not shy. I know you're not. That's one of the things I really appreciate about you. <laughs> I, shyness is not a value in my world, uh, so well, I understand. Yeah, yeah you know, it's. Uh, this is the only life I have, and I intend to live it full out. So far, so that good. Sounds great. Well, let me check our time. I think we're about to the point. Oh, well, we're about done. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I don't want to keep you on there any too much longer because you have been marvelous. And like I said, we're going to do another deeper interview. I don't know if you're ready for that one. But another deeper interview for Galaxy's Edge we'll, after we get through all this. Okay. When is uh, that going to be? Appreciate it. Uh, I don't know yet. I've got to get that one worked out. Okay, so we haven't okay. scheduled it yet. Well, it'll be fine. I'll be fine. It's going to be a little longer, and it'll be a little bit more into the who is Stephen Barnes at the base kind of thing. So Fair enough. You know, no and questions so are off the table. Ask me anything you want. I got well, thank you. I appreciate that. As I said, that's one of the things I love about you as an oh, interviewee. Very cool. Well, I'm going to let you go then. We'll let thank Walter you, Joy. catch up with us somewhere along the line. Thank you very much. And for all of our viewers, please do check out Stephen Barnes' work. He's got all kinds of stuff. Books, graphic novels, movies, television. <laughs> Definitely check out the television shows. By the way, is that the, that's the new Outer Limits, isn't it? No. Well, yes, it was the new Outer Limits the episode. You're, was you're too the young to be time. on the old Outer Limits. That's right. But uh, I just, I, I wrote for the first revival of The Twilight Zone. That was my first uh, television episode. And I just recently did an episode for Jordan Peele's revival of The Twilight Zone. So that was- Very uh, cool. cool. Very anyway, cool. I gotta go. Go. Well, thank you so much. Thank and you so much. give our good regards to your whole family. I will do that. And you stay take safe care. down there. Kay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.